You're listening to the free ad-sponsored re-release of American Elections Wicked Game, a weekly march through every presidential election from 1789 to 2024. To listen to all episodes right now ad-free, go to intohistory.com. Subscribers there enjoy ad-free listening, early access, bonus content, and more from a growing collection of great history podcasts. Start your free trial today at intohistory.com. It's February 18, 1861, Inauguration Day. After a long train ride, the president-elect has finally arrived. Though his journey was filled with bands, bonfires, and seas of well-wishers in every town, he is filled with trepidation. Escorted by a military parade, he rides to the steps of the Capitol in an elegant open carriage drawn by six white horses. Greeted by tremendous fanfare, he solemnly climbs the stairs and takes his seat on the platform. A Bible rests on the table beside him, along with a stunning wreath of flowers. As a short prayer is offered, he cannot help but feel the weight of the moment. He knows the very survival of the nation celebrating him today rests squarely on his shoulders. When the prayer is finished, he rises to the podium. The crowd falls into the deepest of silence. Called to the difficult and responsible station of chief executive, I approach the discharge of the duties assigned to me with a humble distrust of my abilities but with a sustaining confidence in the wisdom of those who are to guide and aid me in the administration of public affairs and an abiding faith in the virtue and patriotism of the people. The task before him will not be easy. With the Union torn in two, this new leader, former Mississippi Congressman Jefferson Davis, will only be president of the Southern half. I enter upon the duties of office of which I have been chosen with the hope that the beginning of our career as a Confederacy may not be obstructed by hostile opposition to our enjoyment of the separate existence and independence which we have asserted, and with the blessing of Providence, intend to maintain. In his inauguration speech on the steps of the Alabama Capitol, Jefferson Davis evokes the Declaration of Independence. He defends the Confederacy and what he views as their right to secede. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish governments whenever they become destructive of the ends for which they were established. As a necessity, not a choice, we have resorted to the remedy of separation, and henceforth our energies must be directed to the conduct of our own affairs and the perpetuity of the Confederacy which we have formed. Davis then offers a warning to those in the North who might oppose him. But if the integrity of our territory and jurisdiction be assailed, it will but remain for us with firm resolve to appeal to arms and invoke the blessings of providence on a just cause. When his speech is done, Davis places his hand on the Bible and is sworn in as the first president of the Confederacy. As he affirms his oath, he shouts with a firm voice for all to hear, so help me God. Then Davis bends low to gently kiss the Bible. From the windows above, flower petals rain down upon the new president. Meanwhile, that very day, news reaches the other president-elect, Abraham Lincoln, as he's about to give a speech in Albany, New York. It's one of his many inaugural stops on the way to Washington, where he will be sworn in as the 16th president of the United States. Davis's inauguration weighs heavily on him. He knows conflict is inevitable. Lincoln tells the crowd in Albany, it is true that while I hold myself without mock modesty, the humblest of all individuals that have ever been elevated to the presidency, I have a more difficult task to perform than any one of them. If you're a careful Wicked Game listener, you know in the credits I mentioned my friend Professor Greg Jackson and his podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. It's a great show. But one way it can doesn't suck even more is when you listen to it without ads. You can listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game, all episodes of History That Doesn't Suck, and all episodes of many more great history podcasts without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. History That Doesn't Suck is a deeply researched chronological survey of American history from a trained academic who also knows how to tell a story. Plus, in addition to ad-free listening to one of the best American history podcasts out there, you get scores of bonus episodes at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. 
icebergs, jagged rocks and rocky straits, mutinies, misfortune, and broadside battles. There are more tales of the sea than survivors to tell them. But the podcast Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is doing a good job, and you can listen to all episodes of that podcast plus many others, including American Elections Wicked Game, without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is one of my favorites from last year, a podcast about the greatest mishaps, misfortune, and misadventures of the sea. You'll hear stories of corruption, greed, bad intentions, and just plain horrible decision-making that resulted in some of the worst maritime disasters from all over the world. And some of these are more recent than you think. All episodes are ad-free, including bonus content and more, at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. From Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Elections Wicked Game. The election of 1860 set the stage for the greatest constitutional crisis the country has ever known. Republicans campaigned on limiting slavery's expansion. Democrats ran on the fear that a Republican victory meant the end of slavery once and for all. Then, for the first time in the nation's history, a section of the country refused to recognize the results of a Democratic election. Even before Lincoln was inaugurated, seven Southern states seceded from the Union to form the Confederate States of America. They created a new constitution which bolstered states' rights and protected slavery. Within months, four more states joined the Confederacy, and the country was at war. In the midst of the bloodiest war in American history, the election of 1864 was a referendum not only on Lincoln, but on the war itself. In the battle for the presidency, Lincoln would face a disgruntled general who sought to end the war, an angry faction of the North who sought to end emancipation, and forces of rebellion sought to end the bonds of union once and for all. The stakes could not be higher, and to win, Lincoln would need nothing short of a miracle. This is episode 20, 1864, McClellan versus Lincoln, Providence. It's April 12, 1861, just before dawn in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. On an island in the center of the harbor stands Fort Sumter, Protected by two shoreline forts, Castle Pickney and Fort Moultrie, Sumter is supposed to be impenetrable. But tonight, Union Major Robert Anderson is facing the unthinkable. The Confederacy has seized the surrounding shoreline forts, and now their 43 cannon batteries are aimed inward, right at Anderson and his men. A Confederate delegation, led by Stephen D. Lee and James Chestnut, has arrived by boat to press for Anderson's surrender. Major Anderson... I see you received General Beauregard's offering, therefore also his request. What say you? We have patiently waited your reply. Please return the cigars and brandy to the General and thank him for the courteous terms proposed and for the high compliment paid me. Then inform him that, regretfully, my sense of honor and my obligations to my government prevent my compliance. General Beauregard was Anderson's student at West Point. He sent cases of cigars and brandy as tribute to his former professor, But if Major Anderson doesn't abandon the fort, this teacher and former student would become adversaries in combat. Be reasonable, Major. Surrender. As General Beauregard has assured you, he does not wish to needlessly bombard Fort Sumter. Nor do I wish to be bombarded. If you do not batter the fort to pieces about us, we shall be starved out in a few days. Anderson is trying to buy time. On March 5th, he sent word to President Lincoln that his men were running low on rations. Unless they are reinforced or resupplied soon, the siege will be over. But Beauregard's orders from Jefferson Davis are to force a surrender before any ships arrive. General Beauregard regrets to inform you that his orders are to accept nothing short of your immediate evacuation, Major. The General knows me as a man of honor. I say respectfully and with all truth that I will need time to prepare for the evacuation. Major Anderson knows he cannot win this battle. He's surrounded by more than 3,500 Confederate troops. Even with Fort Sumter at full strength, it would be a tough fight. But with insufficient munitions and only 85 soldiers under his command, Major Anderson knows that he doesn't stand a chance. His only hope is delay. Please thank the general for his patience and assure him that I will evacuate my men in three days' time. 
No, you will order your men to lay down their arms and begin their evacuation now. I tell you, sir, I will not give that order. Then by authority of Brigadier General Beauregard of the Confederate States, we must notify you that his batteries will open fire on Fort Sumter in one hour. Major Anderson is out of time and out of options. He fears that by ordering his men to remain at their post, he has doomed them. As he escorts the Confederate envoy back to their boat, he shakes their hands in farewell. If we never meet in this world again, God grant that we may meet in the next. The Confederates row into the darkness. Before they reach the shore, they lay down their oars and wait in silence. Then, at 4.30 a.m., the Confederate cannon fires a 10-inch mortar, setting off a 34-hour barrage and igniting the American Civil War. On March 4, 1860, during his inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln had walked a fine line. He could not look weak, so he declared secession unconstitutional. Addressing the issue of federal forts in the South, such as Fort Sumter, he had pledged to hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government. But at the same time, he could not appear too confrontational. Hoping to avoid war, Lincoln had promised that there would be no invasion, no using of force against or among the people anywhere. He instead put the onus of war on Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Lincoln declared, In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. But Lincoln had also assured Davis he could not tolerate disunion. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. The siege at Fort Sumter was the first test of Lincoln's resolve. Lincoln had a difficult choice. Lose Fort Sumter along with any semblance of federal authority or protect the fort and provoke war. Lincoln was conflicted, and so was his cabinet. Lincoln had assembled a motley group of men with politically disparate voices. The Fort Sumter crisis, the first to face Lincoln's cabinet, only highlighted their differences. Secretary of State William H. Seward, founder of the Republican Party, advised abandoning the fort to avoid a civil war. Postmaster General Montgomery Blair and Secretary of the Treasury Salmon P. Chase wanted a show of force. They insisted the president order a group of warships to support Sumter, believing every hour of delay strengthened the Confederacy. But while Lincoln's cabinet was locked in an endless debate, Major Anderson's men at Fort Sumter were starving. President Lincoln faced another dilemma, a problem that plagued his presidency throughout the war, how to respond to the Confederacy without losing any of the slaveholding border states. Lincoln knew a situation like Fort Sumter required a delicate touch. If he pushed too hard, the border states might secede. In one of his first acts as president, Lincoln displayed his gift of political savvy. He didn't send in the Navy and their guns, and he didn't abandon the fort. Instead, he found a third, more calculated move. He sent ships to resupply the fort. Confederate President Jefferson Davis had hoped the Union president would order an outright attack. He believed any sign of Northern aggression would help rally the South and push the border states into rebellion. Instead, Lincoln's decision forced Davis to initiate an attack, making the Confederacy the provocateur. When the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter, it was an act of war, and it gave Lincoln the public support he needed to reunite the country and fight back with force. In response to the attack on Fort Sumter, the Northern newspapers rattled their sabers and the public clamored for war. On April 15, 1861, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to repossess the forts, places, and property which had been seized from the Union. Then, on July 21st, the first major battle of the Civil War was fought. President Lincoln's orders to Brigadier General Irvin McDowell were to march on the new Confederate capital of Richmond. When Confederate troops met them at Manassas Junction, Virginia, many believed the conflict would end swiftly, much like Shays' Rebellion in 1787. But the first battle at Bull Run would be anything but quick and decisive. It was an embarrassing defeat for the Union, whose untrained and unprepared forces were routed from the field. General McDowell was relieved of his command. Lincoln knew he needed someone to mold his army of volunteers into a formidable force, so he turned to a man with a reputation for getting the job done, a man with the nickname Young Napoleon, Major General George B. McClellan. 
McClellan was a West Point graduate, renowned for his service in the Mexican-American War, and considered the ideal choice to lead the Union forces. He spent the winter of 1861 retraining his men for an assault on Richmond. Lincoln didn't know it yet, but it would be an assault the general would never make. In fact, the only assault McClellan would ever lead would be one against his own president. In late 1861, as President Lincoln fought against the Confederacy, he also faced another issue that threatened the solvency of the Union, bankruptcy. The goods the army needed to fight, uniforms, and even the Union flag itself, were mostly made in Europe. And European countries, while refusing to aid the North, were investing their gold in southern cotton production. In purchasing goods from Europe, the North was unknowingly funding the South's rebellion. Meanwhile, corruption in the Union capital was rampant. Not only was the government filled with Southern sympathizers who sought to undermine the war effort, but there were countless speculators personally profiting off the war. Even Lincoln's own cabinet was caught up in a corruption scandal. Secretary of War Simon Cameron had ties to the railroad industry. He gave the companies that he was close to lucrative government contracts and left their competitors open to Confederate attack. His friends were making money hand over fist, and were even appointed to the government. The vice president of the Pennsylvania Railroad was Cameron's assistant secretary of war. When the scandal broke in late 1861, Lincoln asked for Cameron's resignation. In January of 1862, Lincoln appointed a talented lawyer to replace Cameron, former Attorney General Edwin M. Stanton. A Democrat, Stanton did not care for President Lincoln, and over the years he had made his feelings well known. He especially excoriated Lincoln's weak response to the attacks on Fort Sumter, Though Stanton viewed the president as an inept buffoon, Lincoln saw potential in the famously stubborn and tenacious Edwin Stanton. The two had served on a court case together many years ago, and the experience left an indelible impression on the president. Edwin Stanton was resolute, stubborn, and he got things done his way. Immediately after his appointment, Lincoln's god of war, who he playfully nicknamed Mars, went to work rooting out corruption in the government and in the military. Stanton also tackled the bankruptcy issue, declaring that all military goods would be solely purchased in the North. This put American business back to work and staved off an economic downturn. Stanton also tested the reach of the federal government. Using wartime constitutional authority, Stanton seized the railroads and telegraph lines, putting them to work for the War Department. He even shut down newspapers that shared military secrets or spread Confederate lies or propaganda. All of these actions would serve their purpose in strengthening the Union's cause, but they also tarnished Lincoln's presidency in the eyes of his enemies. Southern sympathizers, known as Copperheads, began to call Lincoln a tyrant. The Copperheads were peace Democrats, a faction in the North who viewed the South's outrage as legitimate and the use of federal force to stop secession as unconstitutional. Throughout the war, they pushed for peace, even if that meant recognizing the legitimacy of the Confederacy or allowing the South back into the Union with new guarantees of slavery. The term Copperhead was a pejorative created by Republicans to invoke venomous snakes. But Peace Democrats embraced the nickname. These Copperheads wore badges with the image of Lady Liberty cut from Copper Liberty head coins. They viewed Lincoln's wartime actions with deep suspicion. and Nothing would enrage the Copperheads more than Lincoln's decision to suspend habeas corpus. From the very beginning of the Civil War, Washington, D.C. was in peril because of its geographical location. D.C. was surrounded by Maryland, a slave state filled with Southern sympathizers who often resorted to acts of sedition. If Maryland were to secede, the capital would be lost to the South. So Lincoln and Stanton took a hard stance against sedition. To maintain order, the president suspended habeas corpus, the right which protects citizens against arbitrary arrest and imprisonment. Lincoln gave federal marshals the authority to imprison any person engaged by any act of speech or writing in discouraging volunteer enlistments or in any way giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Among those arrested were the mayor of Baltimore and nine members of the Maryland legislature. Even the famous actor John Wilkes Booth was arrested briefly in St. Louis for making anti-government remarks. Throughout the war, some 18,000 citizens were arrested. The number of military arrests for desertion and corruption would reach a staggering 200,000. But for Lincoln and Stanton, this was a necessary evil. For the Copperheads, it was a rallying cry. As the spring of 1862 passed, the North was losing the war. 
In the West, the Union Navy won a victory in New Orleans, and the Army had a hard-won victory at the Battle of Shiloh, Tennessee, by a lesser-known general named Ulysses S. Grant. But the Eastern Theater had been a disaster. Under General McClellan, the Army of the Potomac had been stuck in a stalemate. McClellan had failed to take Richmond and suffered a string of humiliating defeats which only bolstered the Copperhead's calls for peace. The war weighed heavy on Lincoln. Throughout his presidency, Lincoln battled fits of melancholy, which many modern historians and psychologists have labeled a major depressive disorder. Nothing, however, hit Lincoln's spirits harder than the death of his 11-year-old son. On February 20th, 1862, Willie Lincoln died from a typhoid-like illness. Historians blame the contaminated water in the White House, the same issue that likely killed Presidents Harrison, Polk, and Taylor. Lincoln was traumatized. Mary Todd Lincoln was inconsolable and wore nothing but black for a year. But Lincoln's personal tragedy had one unexpected consequence. In the summer of 1862, it solidified a bond between the president and his war secretary, Edwin Stanton, who had lost his own son. Stanton and Lincoln would soon unite in a common purpose around a controversial issue. Lincoln's embrace of emancipation would redefine the landscape of the war, unite the North, and put the rebels on their heels. Tired of ads and promos like these? Want to skip ahead to newer elections? You can listen to all episodes of American Elections Wiki Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. But not only that, you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts, also all ad-free. That includes the American Revolution podcast, a deep and thorough investigation of the times, people, and politics behind America's fight for independence. Also, the battles, because we can't start a new American nation without guns. And the American Revolution podcast tells the story of the revolution from beginning to end, from its origins in the French and Indian War, through the war itself, and on to the founding of the United States. Get American Elections Wicked Game, the American Revolutions podcast, and many others ad-free with bonus content at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. Did you know you can skip ads and promos like these and listen to all episodes of American Elections Wiki Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com? And not only will you be getting the whole series ad-free and bingeable, but you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts also ad-free, like Her Half of History. Because even though Hillary Clinton may not have made history when she ran for president in 2016, there have always been women who seized power, spied for their country, created artistic masterpieces, even escaped slavery. Her half of history is perfect for all those who sat in history class and wondered, what were the women doing all this time? Because the answer is a lot. Get Her Half of History, Wicked Game, and many others ad-free at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. It's October 1st, 1862, and General McClellan's Army of the Potomac is at a standstill. The Peninsular Campaign, McClellan's attempt to take Richmond, has been a complete failure. The President and Secretary of War have prodded the General for months to advance, to go on the attack, but have resulted in nothing but retreat. Though they feel they have given the General ample troops to win, McClellan is stalled again. Surrounded by his army, he spends more time in camp than on the battlefield. Today, President Lincoln has surprised McClellan at his camp headquarters to personally push young Napoleon to be more aggressive. Mr. President, I only just heard of your arrival. Had I known, I would... Please, please, George. I mean, no fuss. McClellan is a man of pomp and pretense. The president's informality is insulting and grates on his nerves, but he chooses to ignore it. Is Secretary Stanton with you? No, no, it's just me, George. I felt it best to speak to you in private. Mars is a diligent man, but also a stubborn one, as you know. With him around, it's sometimes hard to get a word in. When his peninsular campaign failed to take Richmond, McClellan was removed as general-in-chief of the entire Union Army, a move he blamed on Stanton. Now the general has stalled again, this time in Maryland, in pursuit of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Here in camp, alone with Lincoln, McClellan blames his blunders on a lack of support from the War Department. Mr. President, may I be frank? Please do, General. Honesty is always the best policy. If I save this army now, I tell you plainly, I owe no thanks to any other persons in Washington. Oh? I'm sorry to hear that, George. We have done our best to give you any resources available. If I am not given the men I require, I will be forced to surrender. 
Either sustain me or I will relinquish my command. McClellan has just won a hard-fought victory at the Battle of Antietam. By providence, his men discovered Lee's battle plans, but with his timid advance, he barely won his victory. Now Lee is in retreat, and if McClellan can catch him, he can help end the war. George, I, I assure you, we have done everything to support you. You did a great service to the country at Antietam. Now Lee is on the run. You must remain in command and carry us through to the end. Advance is impossible, Mr. President. My army is not fit for it. The old regiments are reduced to mere skeletons and are completely tired out. They need rest. The new regiments are not yet fit for the field. Lincoln appeals to McClellan's pride. General, you are the best officer in the Union Army. No one could have pulled off the victory at Antietam but you. And I believe no one more capable of advancing on Lee's army and finishing the job. You could bring this war to a close, General. By the end of the year, you could be commanding a victory parade in Washington. The next morning, just before daybreak, Lincoln rises from his tent, wakes an aide, and the two hike up a hill near the tent city. Lincoln walks in silence. As the two reach the top of the hill, the sun breaks over the horizon, and Lincoln surveys the army below him, mulls something over in his mind. Then he whispers to his aide, Hatch, Hatch, what is all this? Uh, Mr. Lincoln, it's the Army of the Potomac. Lincoln straightens up and resolutely declares, No, Hatch, no. I believe this is merely General McClellan's bodyguard. Lincoln has made up his mind. If McClellan fails to capture Lee in his retreat, he will have no choice but to remove him from command. McClellan's victory at Antietam Creek on September 17, 1862, was a turning point in the war. It was the first major victory in the East for the Union. Lincoln had been waiting for such a victory to make a monumental announcement. At the onset of the conflict, Lincoln's primary goal had been the reunification of the country. That included preventing any further secession. Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, and Missouri all practiced slavery, but had not yet seceded. And so Lincoln had tread carefully around the subject of slavery. But for abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, the Civil War had always been a fight between freedom and bondage. In Douglass's view, the sin of slavery could only be ended through bloodshed. Another abolitionist, John Mercer Langston, agreed. Langston said, in making the war about abolition, we will have the sympathy and approval of God, as well as the sympathy and approval of all civilized nations. But perhaps no one had more impact on Lincoln's view of slavery than Edwin Stanton. Stanton despised slavery. His father was an avid abolitionist, and Edwin Stanton's childhood home had been a stop on the Underground Railroad. For Stanton, not only was emancipation a righteous cause, it was a strategic one. Slavery fueled the rebellion. Confiscated slaves could turn the tide of the war in the North's favor. Numerous times, without Lincoln's permission, Stanton had given orders to arm freed slaves, only to have those orders rescinded by the president. On July 21st, two months before the victory at Antietam, and after months of being hounded by his war secretary, Lincoln had first broached the subject of emancipation. It was during a carriage ride on the way to the funeral for Stanton's son. Riding with the president were Secretary of State William Seward and Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells. Wells, whom the president called Father Neptune, made a tremendous impact on the war effort as Navy secretary. He also wrote an extensive diary throughout the war, which documented the inner workings of Lincoln's cabinet. In this diary, he describes the moment Lincoln first mentioned emancipating slaves. According to Wells, Lincoln said, he had dwelt earnestly on the gravity, importance, and delicacy of the movement. He had given it much thought and had come to the conclusion emancipation was a military necessity. At a cabinet meeting the next day, Lincoln presented a draft of his Emancipation Proclamation, freeing all slaves in states held in rebellion. As always, his cabinet was divided. Stanton and Attorney General Speed wanted to issue the proclamation immediately. Secretary of State William Seward was against it. He felt that interfering with cotton production would anger foreign governments and even draw them into the conflict on the side of the Confederacy. Salmon P. Chase, Secretary of the Treasury, opposed the measure for different reasons. Chase often allied himself with the radical Republicans, the progressive wing of the Republican Party. But while they were for the immediate abolition of all slavery, Chase was not. He feared that Lincoln's proclamation would certainly lead to universal emancipation throughout the entire country. Ultimately, Lincoln chose to move forward with his proclamation. 
but Seward cautioned the president about the timing of the measure. Seward wished for him to wait for the drum and fife in public spirit before issuing anything publicly. He warned the president that if the proclamation were made without a major victory on the battlefield, the public would interpret it as the Union's last shriek on the retreat. Lincoln listened to Seward's counsel and decided to wait for a Union victory. That victory came at Antietam. After McClellan's success, Lincoln said, I made the promise to myself and to my maker. The rebel army is now driven out, and I'm going to fulfill that promise. On September 22, 1862, four days after the victory at Antietam, Honest Abe gave the proclamation. It did not immediately end slavery in the United States, but it was an ultimatum to each state in the South, end the fight by January 1st of 1863, where any slave in any state in rebellion would be free. Young Napoleon McClellan did not support the measure, and he made his opinions known. General McClellan told his wife, the president's late proclamation and the continuation of Stanton in office render it almost impossible for me to retain my commission and my self-respect. The remedy for political errors, if any are committed, is to be found only in the action of the people at the polls. McClellan was turning his mind from the battlefield to the ballot box. Pro-slavery Democrats and many moderate Republicans were incensed by the proclamation. Lincoln had unilaterally changed the purpose of the war. It was no longer just about restoring the Union. Now a victory would include emancipation. Only a few short weeks after the proclamation, Lincoln's political adversaries made their fury known. The 1862 midterm elections were a disaster for the Republicans. The Democrats nearly doubled their number of congressmen, from 44 to 75. In five states where Lincoln had won electoral votes only two years before, the Republican Party lost. Party leaders blamed the defeat on a lack of confidence in the president. The situation went from bad to worse when news reached Lincoln that Lee had escaped Maryland. McClellan's continued refusal to press the attack cost Lincoln an early end to the war. On November 5, 1862, Stanton asked Lincoln about McClellan. Mr. President, what do you think now? Lincoln responded, as you do. And he promptly removed McClellan from command. The order for McClellan's removal did not sit well with many. McClellan supporters claimed that Lincoln had intended to remove McClellan earlier, but had waited until after the 62 midterm elections. Only then would he dare do something so widely unpopular. McClellan himself said, Many were in favor of my refusing to obey the order and marching upon Washington and taking possession of the government. I receive letters often alluding to the presidency, dictatorship, etc. I would cheerfully take the dictatorship and lay down my life when the country is saved. McClellan would not be the only one to dream of a northern rebellion. When the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect on January 1, 1863, the Copperhead Press went on the attack. The Chicago Times protested the proclamation. They claimed that slavery was the only means by which it has at any time been possible to restore the Union. They went on deriding the proclamation. We protest against it as a monstrous usurpation, a criminal wrong, and an act of national suicide. The Chicago Times became so vitriolic that the War Department shut the paper down. But only two days later, after loud cries from the public about freedom of speech, Lincoln ordered the ban lifted. Outrage about emancipation also saw recruitment numbers plummet. This forced Congress to pass the Enrollment Act of 1863, which only incited more backlash. The act required all men ages 20 to 45 to register for a military draft. Many did not want to be forced to fight for emancipation. Many more had issues with the law itself. Those drafted could avoid service if they found a substitute or paid a $300 fine, almost $5,000 today. Copperheads labeled the conflict, rich man's war, poor man's fight. And during the summer of 1863, the outrage turned to violence. In the heavily democratic city of New York, rioters took to the streets. Government officials were attacked, buildings burned, hundreds were killed. In the midst of this violence, a famous family of actors was barricaded inside their New York home. One of them longed to join the angry mob, or even the Confederate Army itself, John Wilkes Booth. Away from the violence in New York, a different battle was raging in Pennsylvania. At the Battle of Gettysburg, Union General George Meade won a major victory. He pushed Robert E. Lee's forces back south into Virginia. News of the victory at Gettysburg, along with General Grant's victory at Vicksburg, 
showed that the pendulum was swinging in the direction of the North. Lincoln embraced the moment, giving his famous Gettysburg Address, where he proclaimed that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. Though the Emancipation Proclamation had angered pro-slavery Democrats, it had united abolitionists. Black abolitionists like John Mercer Langston and Frederick Douglass were hard at work recruiting black men to fight for the colored regiments, which not only protected Washington, but fought valiantly on the field of battle for their freedom. By January of 1864, Senator Lyman Trumbull of Lincoln's home state of Illinois would lead the charge for a constitutional amendment abolishing slavery. General Grant, who had long supported the policy of arming confiscated slaves, was elevated to the rank of Lieutenant General, a rank not given to anyone since George Washington. He was also made the new General-in-Chief of the Union Army. In Grant, Lincoln finally had the general he needed. But as Grant led the charge for the Union, Lincoln would enter a battlefield of his own. With the odds against him and the fate of the country at stake, the presidential election of 1864 was a battle Lincoln fully expected to lose. Did you know you can skip ads and promos like these and listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com? And not only will you be getting the whole series ad-free and bingeable, but you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts, also all ad-free, like Wild West Extravaganza, a journey back to the fascinating, tumultuous, and often violent world of the American Old West. From famous outlaws like Billy the Kid and Jesse James, to lawmen like Wyatt Earp and Wild Bill Hickok, to trailblazing pioneers and frontiersmen, Wild West Extravaganza tells the true stories of the real-life characters who shaped this iconic era. So saddle up and discover the true history of the American frontier, the good, the bad, and the ugly, ad-free at IntoHistory.com. Lincoln's re-election in 1864 was a far cry from a certainty. The war had waged on longer than any had hoped. His unpopular policies, like the Emancipation Proclamation, had stirred many to outrage. Most political observers, including Lincoln, did not think he stood a chance. Others doubted whether a wartime election would occur at all. Republican Party leadership suggested Lincoln postpone the election until after the war. Lincoln pushed back, proclaiming, We cannot have free government without elections, and if rebellion could force us to postpone a national election, it might fairly claim to have already conquered and ruined us. So in June of 1864, Republicans held a convention in Baltimore. For months, radical Republicans had been working to ditch Lincoln for a candidate who would guarantee black civil rights and punishment for the South. They had hoped to find their champion in Salmon P. Chase, Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasury. Chase had used his cabinet position to build political power and was often a burr in Lincoln's side. A circular called The Next Presidential Election endorsed Chase and launched harsh criticisms of the president. The politically ambitious Chase welcomed the opportunity to become president, but did not want to publicly challenge Lincoln until he was certain he had the numbers to win. The Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, correctly foresaw the circular would be more dangerous in its recoil than its projectile. When it fell into Lincoln's hands and was published in the newspapers, Chase was deeply embarrassed. He twice submitted his resignation, which Lincoln refused, not wishing to stir up the radical Republicans. Ultimately, at the Republican convention, the radicals abandoned Chase and threw their support behind Lincoln. After Lincoln secured the nomination, Chase submitted a third resignation. This time, the president accepted. The only person who doubted Lincoln's prospects for winning the election more than the radicals was Lincoln himself. When he accepted, he humbly said of the party, I do not allow myself to suppose that I am either the greatest or best man in America, but rather they have concluded that it is not best to swap horses while crossing the river. That phrase became a campaign slogan. The Republicans centered their platform on the South's unconditional surrender and on a constitutional amendment ending slavery. But with doubts about Lincoln's ability to win, the choice of running mate could make or break the election. In a political gamble, Republicans dropped current Vice President Hannibal Hamlin from the ticket and instead crossed the aisle and nominated a Democrat. Andrew Johnson was a former senator from Tennessee. At the outbreak of secession, Senator Johnson had proven his loyalty. He was the only Southern senator to stand with the North. Once the Union had recaptured Tennessee, 
Johnson returned to his state to serve as military governor. Johnson was a war Democrat, a member of the Democratic Party who supported a Union victory. There was a fracture growing among the Democrats, and the Republicans hoped a Johnson nomination might break the party in two. And when Northern Democrats held their convention in Chicago, the party was indeed tearing itself apart. War Democrats like Johnson battled the Copperheads for the soul of the party. Ultimately, the Copperhead platform prevailed, calling for a peaceful end to the bloodshed. The Democrats then nominated none other than the very general that Lincoln had removed from power, George B. McClellan. Young Napoleon would now have his chance to depose Lincoln and take control of Washington. His campaign slogan was, Old Abe removed McClellan. We'll remove Old Abe. Embracing a policy of peace, McClellan promised to end the war and negotiate terms with the Confederacy. In the summer of 1864, just months before the election, one thing was clear. McClellan was the frontrunner. The Democratic Party had the war-weary public behind them. For over three years, the country had been at war, and the personal losses were mounting. Democrats called Lincoln Abe the Widowmaker. More voters fled to the Democratic camp after reading a Republican campaign flyer called Miscegenation. The Republican flyer advocated for interracial marriage, a radical concept in 1864. But that campaign flyer was not made by the Republicans. It was a fake, a Democrat ploy to play off white America's fear of race mixing. And the ploy worked. It pushed many voters into McClellan's camp, and it earned Lincoln the moniker Abraham Africanus I. But Lincoln and Stanton fought back with their own election tactics. Stanton created the first absentee voting system, which allowed soldiers to cast their ballots from the battlefield. But it was a risky move that could backfire, as many in the army supported General McClellan. And of course, the Confederacy also supported McClellan. Lincoln's defeat at the ballot box would be a victory for the South, and McClellan embraced the Southern support. He privately promised Southern states that if he won, slavery would be protected. As Election Day drew near, Lincoln sunk into melancholy. He was so certain of defeat that he drafted a message to McClellan. General, the election demonstrated that you are stronger and have more influence with the American people than I. Now let us together, you with your influence and I with all the executive power of the government, try to save the country. If the election had been held in August, Lincoln surely would have lost. The dire state of the Union's position in the war almost assured it. Lincoln predicted, I'm going to be beaten, and unless some great changes take place, badly beaten. But as Providence would have it, August and September of 1864 brought Lincoln a campaign miracle. News came of Union victories at Mobile, the Shenandoah Valley, and Atlanta. The string of battlefield victories bolstered public confidence in the Union's ability to win and Lincoln's ability to lead. With a Northern victory within reach, McClellan was forced to abandon his campaign promise to negotiate for peace. So that in the end, the contrast between McClellan and Lincoln came down to one issue their views on abolition. Lincoln's vision for the future included abolition, and McClellan's did not. The results at the ballot box in November of 1864 clearly showed that there had been a monumental shift in public sentiment. The American people resoundingly chose Lincoln. In doing so, they chose to put an end to the institution of slavery forever. Lincoln's victory was, to many of his contemporaries, a miracle. Not only did he win, but it was a rout. Many assumed the soldier vote might swing McClellan's way, but instead, Lincoln received 78% of their votes. And with only northern states voting in the election, Lincoln won 55% of the popular vote and a staggering landslide of 212 electoral votes to McClellan's 21. He carried every state of the Union with the exception of three, Kentucky, Delaware, and McClellan's home state of New Jersey. And in Congress, Democrats were also routed, giving Republicans clear control of both houses. President Lincoln was the first since Andrew Jackson to win a second term. He won a mandate for finishing the war and abolishing slavery. On January 31, 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, forever ending the institution of slavery in the United States. On March 4, 1865, with a speech contemplating divine providence and a wish for malice toward none, Lincoln was inaugurated. On April 3rd, Richmond fell. Less than a week later, General Lee surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox. And on April 14th, 
Robert Anderson unfurled the stained but triumphant flag which once flew over Fort Sumter and rose it once again over the battered citadel. It's April 11th, 1865. A crowd gathers outside the White House, hoping to hear words of victory from President Lincoln. Among them is abolitionist John Mercer Langston. Lincoln is far from perfect, but Langston considers him a statesman without equal, a leader as grand as Moses himself. As Lincoln steps outside onto the balcony, Langston joins the crowd in applause. We meet this evening, not in sorrow, but in gladness of heart. The evacuation of Petersburg and Richmond and the surrender of the principal insurgent army give hope of a righteous and speedy peace whose joyous expression cannot be restrained. Langston listens with anticipation to Lincoln's speech. He takes in the sea of joyous faces, both black and white, who've gathered to witness history. For just a fleeting moment, the future for his people seems bright. But Langston hopes for more than an abolition of slavery. He hopes for universal liberty. It's a subject Lincoln has been reluctant to address, though. By these recent successes, the reinauguration of the national authority, Reconstruction, which has had a large share of thought from the first, has pressed much more closely upon our attention. It is fraught with great difficulty. John Mercer Langston listens as President Lincoln lays out the challenges before them. Langston agrees with Lincoln. Reconstruction will be difficult. But if anyone can lead the country through this arduous transitional period, it is Lincoln. But what the president says next nearly takes Langston's breath away. It is unsatisfactory to some that the elective franchise is not given to the colored man. I would myself prefer that it were now conferred on the very intelligent and on those who serve our cause as soldiers. Langston cannot believe his ears. Before this moment, no president in office has ever publicly spoken about black suffrage. It's something that Langston has fought for his entire life. Though Lincoln's words fall short of a full endorsement of equality for all, it is still a momentous step forward. Langston can't help but smile. But at that same moment, the visage of one man in the crowd falls into a bitter scowl. John Wilkes Booth is listening as well. Since the election, Booth and a gang of conspirators had plotted to kidnap the president. They had hoped to use him as a bartering chip to secure the release of captured Confederate troops and turn the tide of the war. With Lee's surrender, though, Booth's dream of saving the Confederacy was crushed. For Booth, right now, Lincoln's speech is the last straw. He storms away from the crowd and promises himself that by God, I'll put him through. That is the last speech he will ever make. Throughout his presidency, Abraham Lincoln faced multiple attempts on his life. He had survived an attempt to derail his inauguration train, a scheme to blow up the White House, and a plot to infect his blankets with pestilence. He had even had his top hat shot off his head while taking a stroll through the streets of Washington. For Abraham Lincoln, death was an inevitability, and it was beyond his control. He once told Secretary Stanton, if it is the will of providence that I die by the hand of an assassin, it must be so. On April 14, 1865, John Wilkes Booth made good on his threat. Lincoln's victory speech three days prior was the last President Abraham Lincoln would ever make. This is episode 20 of American Elections Wicked Game, 1864, Providence. On the next episode, the election of 1868. In the wake of Andrew Johnson's impeachment, the Democratic Party flounders, and Republicans rally behind a former general committed to preserving Abraham Lincoln's legacy, Ulysses S. Grant. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Elections Wicked Game is an airship production, hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Sound designed by Derek Barons. Music by Lindsey Graham. Co-executive produced by Stephen Walters in association with Ritual Productions. Written and researched by Eric Archilla. Fact-checking by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar from the podcast History That Doesn't Suck.